my name is Audrey Woods. I'm the Assistant Dean of Enrollment Management at the Klein School of Law at Drexel University. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This is our last uh, career event of the semester. It's hard to believe it's already mid-March. Um, tonight, we're going to focus on those of you who are focusing on criminal law. So we have uh, three wonderful panelists with us this evening. Uh, who are doing very different career, have very different careers. And so uh, we're excited to, uh, to talk through how they've gotten to where they are and, and some different options that you may consider. Um, first, we're going to begin with Professor Lichty, who is going to talk us through the virtual career office. I'm just gonna share my screen here and uh, take it away, Professor Lichty. Great, thank you so much. So I wanted to introduce and share with you guys a resource that's available to all students. Um, the Virtual Career Office is a, a tool that a colleague and I, Laura Jacobus, created to support our students in their career search or career advancement, um, career musings and wonderings, and professional skills and development. We can advance. Great, so, so what it is, it's sort of like a choose your own adventure class. So you can go, you can look at the different modules. It's set up like a regular class and that there's seven modules, but you can go to whatever module you'd like in whatever order. There are exercises, um, some things have to do with sort of how you might think about what kinds of careers you may want. Others might be more geared toward mid-career professionals thinking about job advancement. There are videos and then there are also career resources divided by um, our concentrations primarily. There's also a job bank that has listings and that ties into other um, job opportunities. There are live Zoom sessions. This session tonight will be uploaded into the VCO for students who couldn't be here tonight who might wanna look at it in the future. And we've done a series of these um, career evenings. So those other videos are available there as well as some videos um, where we did live sessions or before, even before the pandemic and early in the pandemic where we had a question and answer with student, student groups. And then additionally, you have access to myself and to, to, to other mentors and, and Laura, my colleague, another professor who teaches compliance and risk in, in the MLS program. And we're available to critique your resume, to, to offer advice based on specific questions. Really, that's it in a nutshell. You can you have the ability to, to see it there on your own. In my course, the Intro to Legal Studies course, it's a link within the course. Um, and I really do hope that you'll check it out. It's designed there to be a resource. It's of no cost. It's included in the program. And the desire is that we would be just supporting you in your career and your career search. And that's it. And there's my email and there's Laura Jacobus' email as well. She really would like to have been here tonight. She's often is, but she's, she's ill at the moment, but she, she sends her, her regards. So thank you all for joining us and hello to everybody who is tuning in after the fact. Um, I'm thrilled to have some great panelists here who are experienced with our program, but before I turn it over to each of them to introduce themselves, I thought I would just let Pavneet introduce herself for those of you who don't know her and tell you a little bit about her role. And then we'll turn it over to our panelists. I'll ask each of them to introduce themselves. And then we have a series of questions, but if our questions don't cover what you'd like to hear about, let us know in the chat and we can try to answer whatever questions you have. And with that, I'll turn it over to Pavneet to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Pavneet Kaur and I'm one of the MLS ambassadors and I've had Professor Finkelstein and also Professor Lichty as my professors in the past. Um, and basically, um, I was working with the other MLS ambassadors to comply with the panels. So I was able to actually get one of the panelists on here, um, Christy Weisel, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, but other than that, I hope you guys enjoy it. Again, it will be a really good learning experience for myself too, to know the different types of careers that you can get in criminal law. Uh, but yeah, I'll just hand it over to <laughs> Professor Finkelstein. And yeah, thank you. Okay, and in no particular order except the order that you are displayed on my Zoom, um, why don't we start with Erica and have her introduce herself and then Desiree and then Christy. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Erica Roscoe, uh, class of 2018, Master's in Legal Studies with a concentration in criminal law. I currently work 
in uh, the Bronx Supreme uh, Courthouse with a uh, judge who was under the criminal term. And uh, it's uh, very interesting. <laughs> Did we want to discuss, I'm sorry, education? and, and Yeah, history? yeah. Tell okay. us a little bit about, um, other than the MLS, what your education is and sort of what, what your uh, job title is. And then after we introduce yourself, we'll go around and do what a typical day is like for people who are interested in getting a job like yours. Okay, so I have my um, associate and certificate in paralegal studies. I have a bachelor's in forensic psychology with a minor in law, and then my master's in legal studies from Drexel, and I'm currently pursuing my PhD in criminal justice. Um, I started as a paralegal in a nonprofit organization once I got my uh, associates, and then while obtaining my master's, I ended up uh, working as a senior court representative in criminal court. It's um, for a program that does alternative to incarceration. So it's a program that um, assists with juveniles who have felony conviction, well, not convictions, excuse me. They are uh, accused of felony crimes and they are given the opportunity if they qualify and if they are willing to participate in an alternative to incarceration program. The program includes education, uh, rehabilitation, mental health services, and compliance with what the uh, judge requires them to do up to a year of service. I did this job for about three years. And then after that was laid off. It just happened that one of the judges from criminal court remembered me, found out that I was let go of, and needed a legal specialist. So he reached out to me, thank goodness I kept my phone number, <laughs> reached out to me and offered me the position. I applied and at the time of my application, I was already up, uh, in the process of obtaining my PhD and he goes, you're too qualified, overqualified, overeducated. Why don't you just become a lawyer? I said, because I don't wanna be a lawyer. <laughs> And he offered me the position and he'll be retiring at the end of the year, but he's already referred me to a couple of other uh, judges within Supreme Court to work with them. So that's my process now. <laughs> Great. All right, Desiree, you want to tell us a little bit about your education and your career path up until the present? Sure. Um, so my name is Desiree Cheng. I graduated um, from the MLS program in late 2017, um, I believe at the time I was seven months pregnant, um, I consider myself to be more of an adult um, student. I had taken about four or five years off right out of high school and then went back and did my associates at a local community college in criminal justice. Um, and then from there, and I, I do have to apologize, I also have a little one to be here in the background. Um, and then from there, I did, because I had kind of done the, the my associates part-time, it had kind of drug it out, to be frank. Um, so then once I finished that, I came to, to Drexel and I kind of hit fast forward and was doing everything, uh, working full-time and doing classes full-time. And I've always had an interest in the criminal justice system, but I also teetered between that and psychology. And so I got my bachelor's in psychology um, and really wasn't sure. I've had a love of law and I've always been kind of gravitated towards it. It's almost like an innate skill. I feel like I look at things from a legal perspective. And so I knew for sure I was going to go back for my master's and decided to go back towards the field of law because ultimately maybe another five-year goal is to get my JD. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but between doing that, knowing that that was kind of ultimately where I wanted to be somewhere within a field that marries the psychology and criminal justice, I did some part-time clinical work with drug and alcohol. I worked for a local county, um, started administrative and clerical and worked my way up until I finished my bachelor's. And then I went to adult probation and parole in that county and I did four years there while working to complete my master's and I had a specialized population of the mental health and developmental disabilities. And I struggled in that position. Um, I felt as though I was 
potentially on the wrong side of the law, um, being more of an advocate than an enforcer, um, I struggled with it ethically. And that's what made me start to, and I'm going to apologize because <laughs> my co-panelist is, is on his way back. Um, but I struggled with that. I loved what I did in advocating for the, for the clients that I had and, you know, speaking with judges and, and trying to get more fair sentences and things. But i I felt as though my advocacy was falling on deaf ears. And so I started to look elsewhere. And now um, I've been at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission as a civil rights mediator for a little over a year. And I love it. Um, I, I have the legal side that I love in being a mediator, you know, being familiar with civil rights laws, Pennsylvania jurisdiction and things of that nature. So I, I get that, but I'm also, you know, working with the social justice and and what I consider to be on the right side for myself ethically and morally. Um, so that's where I've been and and I love it. So. All right, and then how about Christy, if you don't mind introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about your education and your career path. Absolutely, thank you. Um, so I'm Christy Weisel. I'm currently an assistant special agent in charge for the United States Department of Transportation Office of Inspector General. Um, I've been with the Department of Transportation since October of 2019. Um, but prior to, the, prior to that, I was a special agent uh, with the United States Department of Agriculture Office of Inspector General for actually 20 years. Um, and so that all started uh, while I was a junior in college. Um, I actually began as a student intern with the Department of Agriculture Office of Inspector General. And I'll be honest, at the time, I had no idea what an OIG was or Office of Inspector General was. Um, in fact, when I was offered the position, I considered turning it down. Um, so for those of you who are not aware, um, each cabinet position or cabinet has their own investigative uh, independent agency. Um, so that includes an audit side and an investigative side. Um, I'm on the investigative side, which means we investigate fraud, waste, and abuse uh, within the agency and within the program of the agency. So um, I am a federal, a sworn federal law enforcement officer, um, I, and another term for that is a special agent. Um, so you all are probably familiar with, an, with the FBI or the DEA or Secret Service or ATF. Um, I'm in the same job series. Um, and I'm also authorized and trained to make arrests, carry firearms, um, conduct search warrants, surveillance, interviews, all, all the same type of things that a FBI agent would do. Um, I received a bachelor's of science degree in mathematics. I had originally planned on a criminal justice degree. Um, and that's because my father was actually in federal law enforcement as well. So I knew probably by the time I was 12 years old that this was the field that I wanted to be in. Um, I could tell that he loved his job. He enjoyed it. Um, he had the flexibility to make every basketball game and every softball game um, that I had. And so um, now that also meant that he might be working at the kitchen table, you know, by the time I went to bed at night. But I knew he loved his job. And I knew that it, it provided for his family and I knew it was something that I wanted to pursue as well. Um, and again, at the time I thought criminal justice was the route that I needed to take for that. Um, but after I uh, got the internship, I said, man, I've already kind of started working. I wanna get out of college as quickly as I can. So I started looking at um, the classes that I'd already taken and um, other uh, potential degrees. Um, and I realized I could get out um, a little earlier if I pursued mathematics, um, just because I had taken advanced placement classes in, in uh, high school. So that's the, that's the way that I went. Um, I realized once I got into the career that while some of my coworkers had criminal justice degrees, um, a lot of them did not. Um, it was okay not to major in criminal justice. It was okay not to have the criminal background. Um, I, I've met agents who are uh, English majors, accounting majors, um, theology majors, um, psychology. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter what your uh, degree is in, uh, special agents with the federal government is still a possibility. All right. And I have to say that uh, I forgot to introduce myself, but I'm in addition to being a full time um, 
AUSA, so I'm a lawyer by day. Um, I work with people in every capacity that has just been mentioned. I work with paralegals, I work with court staff, I work with mediators, special agents help investigate my cases. So I, I have some experience with all of these different backgrounds. And then when I'm not being an attorney by day, I am teaching in the MLS and JD programs at Drexel at night. So I'm thrilled to have these great representatives of some of the career paths that are uh, program can lead you to. And of course, there are many other career paths as well. So with that, why don't we have each of you tell the participants what an average day is like for you? So, you know, Erica, many people who are tuning in probably have never spent a day in a courtroom. Is it law and order all day long? Is it objections and excitement? Or what does it look like on a day-to-day -day basis in your job? And then we'll go to Desiree and Christy. Uh, Pre-COVID, sitting in a courtroom, it really depended on which case we were hearing. My court part um, hears, they're, they're usually set up in, in different areas. So my court part usually gets the homicide cases, and then every now and again, we'll get um, a mental health case that is not homicide related. It's just a, um, an assault or any uh, violent felony. So pre-COVID sitting in a courtroom, if we were doing uh, jury selection, it would be truthfully, it's not like law and order. It is long. And I really thought it was gonna be something that was gonna be so interesting watching my first voir dire. And after like the third one, you're just sitting there like this, <laughs> just waiting. Like you keep on hearing the same thing over and over and you can basically tell what they're going to choose for their jury. Um, it gets interesting when you actually get to trial. And I have sat there and written down the questions that maybe the, you know, the DA should have asked or the defense attorney should have asked. And I'm just, just, you just observe. Now, during COVID, we are literally like this on a Teams application with our clerk, our court attorney, the judge in one box, and everybody else, and waiting for defendants to be produced if they're still um, in corrections, waiting for everyone to please mute your microphone. A lot of things are basically on standstill right now. We can't have trials, we can't have hearings. It's just a lot of either paperwork, pushing motions, bail applications, and um, just trying to figure out what the next step is until we're actually physically able to accommodate hearings and trials, which from what I hear is probably going to be in April. But for right now, it's just a lot of motions a lot of, uh, like I said, individuals um, for um, either taking pleas because they've been in long enough that the offers from the district attorney are, um, they're able to actually take the plea and be out uh, already based on the time that they've already been in. But uh, I honestly, I can't wait to be back in person <laughs> and do hearings and trials and, and get back to some, some type of normalcy other than just motions. <laughs> <laughs> Desiree, do you want to tell the group what an average day is like for you? Sure. So um, currently I have to kind of echo what, what Erica said. It's, it's, it's very different. Um, and losing that face-to-face -face element is, it definitely creates a shift in the dynamic every day at work. But um, for me, in a day that includes a mediation, our mediation span from three to five hours. And what I do um, typically it, with the mediation sessions, we have complainants. So individuals that have filed a discrimination complaint with our agency, um, alleging discrimination against what we refer to as a respondent. And so um, the days leading up to the mediation session, or I should say weeks, it's conducting outreach, getting parties to agree to their interest in mediation, getting initial settlements from complainants, providing it to respondents to prepare, and then um, kind of giving an overview of what to expect in the telephonic mediations. All of them are being held telephonically at the moment through either Skype or dial-in. Um, we're not utilizing the video feature because a lot of complainants are unrepresented, meaning they don't have counsel and it can be somewhat intimidating participating you know, on their own 
while it's not litigation, it's not legal as the mediator, I'm not a judge or fact finder, um, we are attempting to reach settlement terms that include a legally binding contract. Um, and so what I do is we start with an opening. Um, complainants have the opportunity to share their perspective, why they feel that they were discriminated against. Respondents are offered that same opportunity. We do limit it to 15 minutes because we aren't fact finders. Um, I don't have to be persuaded because I'm neutral. Um, and so my job then is to go into what we refer to as a caucus, which is a private conversation, it's confidential, with one side without the other side involved and look at kind of the strengths of their case, maybe some vulnerabilities within the position, uh, their perspective in their position. I cannot give legal advice because I'm not an attorney and again, I'm neutral, um, but I can explain the laws and that allows for the parties to kind of decide how it would apply to them and their circumstance. And so I go back and forth through a series of caucuses to relay um, the strengths of the opposing side, but also demands, and it often includes a monetary amount. And then I relay from respondent, their position, legal defenses that they've shared with me, and then uh, counter offers to those demands. And it's really a back and forth negotiation. Um, I think the most interesting part is every complainant is different, every circumstance is different, and every allegation has a completely different set of circumstances to hear. And we've heard some really egregious acts of discrimination that are is almost unfathomable. Um, in in particular, like employment settings, you almost wouldn't expect that. Um, and so it kind of opens your eyes to realize it does happen. And we've seen the opposite in which complainants file thinking that they've been discriminated against because they were wronged, but it may not actually rise to the level of discrimination as opposed to um, their employer. It was a you know personality conflict. Um, so I think that's the most interesting part. But as far as the steps, they, they are repetitive. It, it's pretty much the same processes and procedures getting to a mediation, but the mediations themselves, they vary drastically. And Christy, why don't you tell us what an average day is like, if there is an average day for a special agent? <laughs> you kind of you kind of beat me to the punch there. So uh, one of the many things that I love about my job is that there is really no typical day. Um, for instance, yesterday I had a fraud awareness briefing at a West Virginia construction materials conference. Um, I responded to a Freedom of Information Act request and then ended it with preparing a, a reverse proffer um, to present next week to a defense attorney. Um, today, I met with a new agent about uh, expectations for her and offered her some guidance on some of her new cases. Um, and then tomorrow, I get to head to the range and, and uh, shoot some guns and qualify and meet with some other special agents um, and, you know, of course, probably have lunch and liaison. So um, next week, I've got an indictment and an arrest. So um, every day truly is different. Um, and, and that's uh, one of the benefits. I, I don't ever get bored. Um, you know, we, we investigate uh, in my over my career, I've investigated anything from animal cruelty to employee cases to insurance fraud or aviation safety or um, contract impairment and procurement fraud, a lot of white collar crime. Um, but um, oftentimes there's some of that, uh, the drugs and guns and even murder. You froze for a second, Christy. You froze right after the word murder. Sometimes there's even murder and then you froze on the most interesting part of the answer. <laughs> well, then I faded out and there really wasn't much more. <laughs> um, so basically, yes, every day is truly different. And I try to start my days with a to-do list and I never get through the to-do list. Um, so I always have to come back because I get distracted by something else. But um, that's I personally love that about my job. So why don't we go around and have everybody share what you think are skills that are particularly important to your success in the area where you work. And it's, it's kind of nice that we have three different panelists who have really very different jobs, but maybe there's some commonality and some differences amongst the skills. And uh, Erica, why don't we start with you and then Desiree and Christy? Um, well, within my position now, I definitely think that the skills of the, you know, the knowledge of criminal law 
definitely um, a help in an application. I do assist the court attorney with motions and writs. So understanding the law itself is uh, very, very helpful. Also understanding, you know, the, the procedural justice that goes along with it. I will say that my, uh, my degree in forensic psychology and then just also still keeping up with, you know, new trends and any research has helped with a lot of the mental health cases that we have, especially if we are doing any type of 730 exams, which are, you know, uh, mental health and if they're actually capable of proceeding with the, um, the case. So all of that is helpful. And also um, I'm bilingual, so I speak Spanish. So a lot of the defendants that we do have that um, do um, need interpretation, sometimes we will have uh, interpreters and they're not interpreting the correct word because of the, the barrier with different uh, Spanish cultures. And it's helpful to let my judge know that's not what they meant. They meant this instead. So that that's helpful as well. But I think just an overall knowledge of, uh, of criminal law is extremely helpful, at least where, where I'm working right now. Desiree? Sorry, I'm, I keep muting myself to, to avoid Cameron's input. Um, so uh, yeah, I would agree. I think having a, um, a knowledge of the law, I will say, you know, my, my interest in education was in criminal law. And so, and so, no, thank you. Um, and so for that reason, I did have to kind of spend some time when I first got the position to learn more about civil rights law specifically and laws that apply to um, like the EEOC and things of that nature. It, it's not covered as detailed, obviously, through the criminal justice um, specialty. So I did have to take some time to, to kind of learn those things, but having the criminal justice background helped to understand it much quicker. Much quicker. Um, so I think that's, that's certainly important. Also, um, again, I'm neutral and it's really difficult coming from, you know, a position in which I was kind of a, an authoritative figure and having a lot of control over the situation and what a client was permitted to do and not permitted to do and that switching hats and having no real investment in one party or the other was a breath of fresh air, but also a challenge. Um, because you have to be able to look at both sides objectively and look at the strengths and the weaknesses for both sides. Even listening to, again, really egregious types of, of situations, it doesn't take away from what their legal defense might be and, and they exist and that's what, you know, that's what they're gonna do is defend themselves. So being able to look at things objectively, even if you don't agree with one side um, is, is necessary in order for you to be able to be an effective mediator. Um, so I think those two things are probably the most important. And then, oh, so sorry. <laughs> and then communication. Um, being a clear communicator is always helpful. And Christy, how about you? What skills do you think are really important for your day-to-day -day job? Right. So um, one benefit of being an agent is that you're continually learning um, and there's always training available. So um, for me, even even now, 20 plus years into my career, something may come onto my desk that I've never seen before. Um, so I, I can I, I have you have to be able to um, look at that and still want to uh, learn new skills and know that you're not going to you know, get to the point where you know everything. Um, but one skill that I think is particularly important is, is people skills. Um, I am naturally an introvert. So for me, I've actually had to work um, very hard to be able to um, go out and uh, work with other people. Um, if I, COVID for me has been, you know, kind of a blessing. I like to kind of be protected at my home and I can sit behind a screen and talk to people this way um, instead of face-to-face. Uh, -face. But I will say it is much easier to read people, obviously, when you're uh, present in a room together. So talking to people and obtaining facts um, and then being able to present those facts to an AUSA um, and then perhaps ultimately to a jury and a judge are, are very important. Um, and particularly for me in the white collar uh, fraud area, um, 
uh, analytical skills have been extremely helpful for me. Um, a lot of my cases were following the money. Um, so you've got to be able to do that and, and look through things and know what you're looking at, know what it means. Um, so yeah, people skills and analytical skills. I was going to say, you said earlier that the math didn't hold you back, but I actually think math and accounting is incredibly useful as an agent and sort of underappreciated from the outside. Everybody thinks that the job is all busting down doors. Certainly, you sometimes get to bust down doors, but first you have to do all the calculations that get you the subpoena that lets you bust down the doors. Exactly. And it's a balance. And I enjoy both. <laughs> so. The next thing that I wanted to ask our panelists are whether you have any networking or career organizations that you belong to that you think are useful for your career and that you might perhaps suggest that other um, students in our program think about or get involved with. And again, I'll start with Erica. Definitely the Bar Association, uh, the American Bar Association, and then join any of the, there is a criminal justice, uh, a criminal law section. So that helps as well. I am also a part of the local uh, bar association. So since I work in the city, I'm able to join the uh, Bronx Bar Association, but I also joined the Westchester Bar Association. They have a paralegal committee. So I was able to stay on with them due to my previous position as a paralegal. Definitely take advantage of anything the school has to offer. I am part of uh, Drexel Dragons Alumni Association. so any events that they have, any uh, career services, I take advantage of that as well. Um, and then any organizations you can find, even if you're not pursuing your JD, any of the law associations are, are extremely helpful because you're still technically a law student. So take advantage of those and don't underestimate the fact that you're not getting your JD and utilize all of that to get uh, in criminal justice. I will say it is extremely difficult to try and find positions unless they're government positions. And I did go through that, but also try looking outside. Um, I never honestly would have looked at an alternative to incarceration program as something to do within criminal justice. But I spent, I'm going to say about 90% of my day inside criminal court. And I was able to utilize all my skills and all the education I was obtaining at Drexel while sitting in a courtroom, seeing it firsthand. So don't put off certain, certain types of jobs just because they don't have the title of like legal specialist or paralegal because they can really surprise you. That's great. And I know that we have a lot of non-lawyer staff at the U.S. Attorney's Office that do a whole wide variety of different jobs for which a master's of legal studies in a criminal law concentration would be really helpful. And they do not all have the title paralegal and they all do very different things. So I think that's a great piece of advice. Um, you know, think a little bit broadly about who might be doing things that are interesting to you. How about you, Desiree? Do you belong to any organizations that you think are useful? Um, so uh, currently in my current role now, I'm part of the Council of Mediators. It, it's nothing that I probably would have crossed my path otherwise. Um, what I would suggest is it's very competitive. And especially if you are even in government, um, the positions are extremely competitive. And so, you know, the, 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 any way that you can bolster your resume to have you stand out, take advantage of. Um, and so, you know, I was very strict on my academics. I took it very seriously. So even in my undergrad and associates, I have um, honors associations in at all three levels. Um, the psychology honors program, I was a part of that. Um, the legal program, I was a part of that. So any way that you can kind of add to your accolades and, and have your resume stand out among the many, many that, that you'll see, I believe I was told, um, when I was selected for the position that there was 123 applicants for one position. Um, so it's extremely, extremely competitive. Um, that and, and if you're looking in, you know, being within the criminal justice field and looking more on the social work side or advocacy side, any type of community outreach events that you can attend and make yourself a part of even through volunteer, um, believe it or not, it's a small 
community. Um, like once you work your way up, it almost becomes a funnel. And so if you're able to rub elbows with the right individuals, um, the names start, you start to see repeat names and faces. And so it certainly will help you when you are out in the field looking for careers um, or trying to advance and even possibly shift directions, knowing names and, and affiliations and things like that are helpful. Um, so I wouldn't limit myself, even if you have an interest in a specific field, you know, things could change that would potentially change your interest. And so you want to keep yourself, keep your exposure broad and keep your interests broad, um, as broad as you can. Like I said, I always had an interest in law, always thought that I was going to go, you know, possibly law enforcement or and, and once I was a PO, while I loved it, um, there were elements that I struggled with. And I found after four years, it was not a lifelong fit for me. Um, so, so certainly keep your options open. Yeah, this one is a little um, difficult for me. I, one place I would suggest is the um, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Um, you don't already have to be um, involved in law enforcement to get into that one. And it's a, it's a designation um, that if it is on your resume, like Desiree was saying, um, would stand out. Um, once you are involved in law enforcement, um, there's the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association. Um, they wouldn't like that I call them a union, um, but they're, they're like the union for federal law enforcement officers. Um, and then there's um, also an organization, Women in Law Enforcement. Um, and Erica and Desiree touched on this a little bit too. Um, it is about relationships and building relationships. Um, uh, it, it is a um, sort of a game of who you know, because these positions are so competitive. Um, you know, one single 1811 uh, job position can see a thousand applicants. Um, so it is about um, name recognition and building relationships. Um, and kind of, um, if you do have those relationships, you may know about a job opportunity a little earlier than someone else. So you can uh, get that resume prepared and, and uh, cover letter prepared specifically for that job. Um, and, and when it hits um, USA Jobs, which we'll talk about later, um, you can be ready to present that. I was just going to say something about USA Jobs. Part of the trick is knowing the right places and where the jobs are posted. And that's something that the career services can help you with. Um, that's really, really valuable. Okay, so here's a fun one. If you could travel back in time and talk to your younger self, don't give your younger self any fashion advice or, you know, you know, warn yourself in a way that's going to cause a butterfly effect, but career advice. If you could go back and give your younger self some career or educational advice, what would that advice be? And I'll start with Erica. I think the one piece of advice I would give myself, uh, my younger self would be look at other positions other than what uh, you originally wanted. I originally wanted to be a profiler for the FBI and things change and don't put all your eggs in one basket. Look at other options, even within that same field of, of you know, psychology and the law, just look for other options and don't get blindsided and figure out two years later that <laughs> you could have been doing something and have like a 20 year career already and start late. That's right. So I think mine is kind of similar to Erica's. Um, I think if I could give myself advice, it would be not to think that what I had on my plate at 18, 19 was so overwhelming that I couldn't handle it because I feel like I have a new skill set of juggling and multitasking that I never would have thought I could have handled 10 years ago. And looking at what was on my plate then or 20 years ago, excuse me, Looking at what was on my plate then versus now was nothing. I mean, I would I would change places with myself as far as the responsibility level in a heartbeat. So, um, yeah, do it do it while you're young. And I know it's so cliche, but it's true. <laughs> and Christy, sure. Um, one thing I would say is uh, don't limit yourself. You you can have it all. Um, you can, it may take time, but you can find your balance if that's what you desire. If you want a family and a career, you can do both. Um, I, I have three kids and a husband who's also an agent and we manage. Now, some days things might fall, but we manage, we can do it. 
Um, another thing I would say is um, say yes to opportunities. Um, my younger self, uh, you know, I wanted my free time and weekends for me. Um, but if, if someone is op offering you opportunities for training or sponsorships or details or additional duties or responsibilities, say yes. Um, because you're gonna you're gonna get something out of those, and it's definitely something you can put on your resume as well, and and uh, it'll help you stand out from the rest of the crowd. All right, so now here's the question that everybody's been waiting to hear. Your jobs sound awesome. You guys have amazing career paths. We all want to do what you do. So let us know. You guys hiring? And I'll start with Erica. Unfortunately, New York State has a hiring freeze right now. <laughs> so no, we're not. And I'll be extremely honest with you. My judge is retiring at the end of the year. So I might not have my position <laughs> unless I can find something. So I think I'll be going to that Drexel career board <laughs> kind of soon, unless you're hiring for professors. <laughs> I'll be right there with you. But no, I would definitely say just keep checking which is what I tell everyone who asks me if they're hiring. Just definitely keep checking. And uh, USA Jobs is definitely- I was just gonna say that to you yes. since I'm sure that Christy's gonna touch on that. Yeah, I, I love that, that platform. It is amazing. <laughs> okay, Desiree, we all wanna work for the HRC. They're a great organization. So even if not mediators, are they hiring for anything right now? Or how would, and even yes. if they're not, how would someone find jobs at the HRC? Right, so um, yes, the, while Pennsylvania was on a hiring freeze, I'm not certain if it still applies to all um, agencies or departments, but the PHRC is looking for investigators. Um, our department, the mediation program is very small. It's myself, I have one co-mediator and our director um, who she's currently wearing two hats. Um, but as far as investigators, we, there's three uh, regional offices, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and Harrisburg. So we span the state and they're always looking. Um, there's usually always at least one seat empty as far as investigators are concerned. And it is a great um, entry level position or even um, after you, we have a lot of like veterans that have done their 20 years and now have come over or 20 years of law enforcement and have come over and are now looking for, you know, want to stay somewhere in there. And so they, they're investigators now. Um, and so the best way is to check the state government um, website. And I would also recommend, I know for myself, putting in alerts and specific, like narrowing it down so that way you get notified through, um, Indeed or Glassdoor, specifically what you're looking for, the areas and the fields, and you'll get weekly notices. So as opposed to scanning 60 plus postings, you'll get an alert. And that's actually how I ended up in my position. I got the email alert. Um, I didn't check that week because I was busy. I got the email alert about it and it looked interesting and I applied and there I was. So um, make yourself a little, make it a little bit easier and let the jobs come to you if you can. Um, but yes, our agency, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, we are we are always looking for people that want to fight the social justice before you fight with us. So certainly. And then I'm going to turn it over to Christy, who I think is going to mention USA Jobs. But I just want to put in a little plug for it that um, every single day I have friends at different federal agencies or different U.S. attorneys offices who tell me, oh, hey, you know, if you know anybody looking, we're posting a job today. So USA Jobs is a terrific resource and you got to keep checking it over and over and over again because things open and close very quickly. Um, but I will let Christy speak to whether or not her amazing, interesting job is whether there's any openings for working with her as well as generally how you might get a federal government job. Sure. So um, our office is not currently hiring, um, but in a week we might be. So definitely usajobs.gov is the place to look. Um, but let me let me preface that too. So um, to be an agent, we are required to retire by the age of 57, which is not a bad thing. But you have to have 20 years of law enforcement service in order to retire at 57. What that means is you cannot be older than 37 to begin your career in federal law enforcement. 
Um, and it's going to take, it's going to take time. So don't at the age of 36, think you're going to be able to get in there before 37 and then meet that requirement. Um, so that that's definitely something to think about. Um, also what I'll say too is, um, and I can't remember if it was, uh, Desiree or Erica who touched on it about this dream job. Um, if you have a, if your dream job is to be a secret service or excuse me, to be a special agent, um, you want to look for that job, but look for any other investigative type job on USA jobs. It is easier to move within and around the federal government if you're already a federal uh, employee. Um, the other thing is, um, so that, that can be also in internships. Um, th there's several what are called pathway programs that are specifically designed for hiring um, college students or uh, uh, master program students. Um, so some uh, jobs are set aside for that purpose. Another thing is be willing to move. If um, I, you know, I, I started my career, I was fortunate to start my career in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, that is not common at all. Um, major metros are where you're going to get hired as a new agent, typically. So D.C., L.A., um, Chicago, Miami, things like that. So, um, yeah, but USA Jobs, USA Jobs, USA Jobs. <laughs> well, at this point, we've got about 10 minutes left, and I would love to open the floor so that if there's anybody who's in the audience, who's in the program and has a question, this is your time to ask. Um, and Laurel put her hand up immediately. So of course, I have to call on Laurel. But honestly, if anybody in the audience has a question for one of the panelists, for Audrey, for Laurel, for me, for Pavneet, we are here and happy to answer your questions. And with that, I'll let Laurel ask her question. I just wanted to ask a question on behalf of all future panelists, as well as current panelists, knowing that we have a smaller group here than we sometimes do. I heard a couple acronyms and I won't play dumb, but I do want to just define because this will become a video and then people wouldn't have the opportunity to ask. So I heard the I heard writ is a word that I heard. I also, um, Veronica- Erica your, said that. <laughs> yeah, Veronica, your title is an acronym and um, I just think it would be helpful to define those. And if anybody has any, if anybody on the panel has any questions of acronyms they heard that they didn't understand, I, I'm, I'm a big, I'm, I teach the intro course and I'm a big fan of not excluding anyone because we've just never heard of something before. Sure, great question. So um, I'm an AUSA, that's just an abbreviated version of an assistant United States attorney. That's just a fancy way of saying that I'm a federal prosecutor. Um, and actually there are federal prosecutors who handle criminal cases and federal prosecutors who handle civil cases and some who do both and I do both. So that's just a fancy shorthand way of saying that I work for the federal government. So I'm not in private practice. And um, I actually happen to do both criminal and civil cases. And I could probably answer the writ question, but I'm going to let Erica answer the writ question because I practice in federal court and we don't, we do some writs, but writ is a more of a term that you'll hear in state court practice. So I will let Erica answer it unless she absolutely doesn't want to, since she sees them on a daily basis. I do. We, uh, we end up seeing a lot of uh, writs of habeas corpus, which I mean, I, I've used it so often that I honestly, <laughs> <laughs> you kind of forget what it means, but it's, it's just a, it's a request for, for the, the defendant or for the person, or depending on what the actual writ is, it's just another form of uh, a type of motion that's, uh, that's used within the courts. And it can, I think it's mostly used in, in criminal court uh, cases, mm -hmm. just because it's, it's reliant on the, on the defendant itself. Right. So when you're in custody, when you are detained in some way, you have certain rights. And so a writ of habeas corpus is one way that you can get those rights enforced while you're in custody. But there's all kinds of other different writs, especially in Pennsylvania, which is a commonwealth, which uses really old fashioned language. You can file all kinds of writs, writs to attach somebody's property so that they can't sell it because at the end of the lawsuit, you want to be able to use that to pay off the whatever the judgment is. Um, writs to garnish somebody's wages because they owe you money and you want to get it out of their paycheck before they get an opportunity to. So I thought that was funny, Erica, when you said Ritz, because that's a very, um, clearly there's some similarities between Pennsylvania and New York in the way that their criminal practice is. Other questions? Oh, Laurel, go ahead. Did we miss any acronyms? What? 
I teach constitutional law. I, you get, everybody in my course gets their little mini version of constitutional law. So obviously there's writs of certiorari too to get to the Supreme Court. Um, and habeas corpus means show me the body, quite literally, I believe. So mm -hmm. FYI, that's just because just other people will be listening to this in the future. Maybe that's helpful. Any questions from the audience? I don't have a question, but I will tell you, I just went on to usajobs.gov uh, at the suggestion of this panel. And oh my goodness, I mean, there's a ton and a wide variety. I think Christy's uh, advice about, you know, um, looking at a skill and even if, if you want to be an agent, looking at a different opportunity is, and eventually, you know, maybe you get there. There's so much stuff there. So mm -hmm. I want to encourage everyone to, to, to check it out. I mean, it was, it's great. And there are, and don't limit yourself by job title. Don't go in there and think I only need to look for a paralegal job. There are, I could rattle off 20 different jobs at the U.S. Attorney's Office alone that are not called paralegal, that are all jobs that someone with a master's of legal studies and a criminal law emphasis would be qualified for that are varied and interesting. Things like reentry coordinator, somebody who is organizing people who are coming through reentry court, a, you know, people who had drug and substance abuse, and instead of going to prison or going for a shorter period of time, they're going for treatment. And so we have um, non-lawyers who organize that program and make sure that people come through. We have non-lawyers who are auditors and investigators. They have all different backgrounds, accounting. Some of them have masters of legal studies in criminal justice, and they help us build up our cases. We use non-lawyers as attorney extenders. So they do some jobs that are kind of in between what a paralegal and what an attorney would do to take some of the work off the attorney's plates. There are fraud examiners who work for the government and also work for private firms. Um, I've taught with people who um, give um, uh, uh, lie detector polygraphs, who give polygraph tests. I've worked, and certainly you have to pass a polygraph to work for the FBI. We have a lot of people out there doing jobs like that. We have people who do all kinds of criminal auditing on the healthcare side, making sure that government funds are being spent the right way and that there isn't fraud, waste and abuse. And they work both for the government, but they also work for private insurance companies who run Medicare Advantage programs. And you know, there, there are people in these jobs all over the place. And then of course there's firms which hire not just paralegals to work at law firms, but also healthcare advisors, um, you know, auditors and investigator type roles in all of the law firms. There are big law firms in our city that have full time on staff, somebody who used to do Christie's job, right? Who've, who's got their years of federal service and now goes to work for a firm. So there's all kinds of opportunities in criminal law. I think people get a little pigeonholed and they think I've got to be a paralegal or I'm going to be in court. And certainly those are two places to look, but I would say they're not the only places to look. And you might find really satisfying, interesting jobs like Desiree's job that you just don't think about. I mean, I think a lot of people in a criminal justice program or a master's of legal studies program don't think to themselves, I could be a mediator. But you absolutely could. And part of the task is being open minded, like Christy suggested, and casting a wide enough net. And like Erica suggested, being a little flexible, starting in one thing, switching to something else. There are so many interesting jobs on the criminal law side that do not require you to be a lawyer. And if all you're thinking about is being a paralegal, you're missing out on some amazing opportunities. And I don't want to associate this specifically with criminal law in a in a way specifically to seem um, prejudicial or something. But I, if I just listening to the news right now, immigration is a really mm -hmm. big thing right now, and they're hiring a lot. So, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. I've had friends who have been um, uh, administrative judges in that in that field, but they I know they're constantly hiring because, and I know under the new administration, there's going to be a lot more jobs, and that's regional too. So it's not just located in Washington, D.C., obviously, you need officers, um, translators, investigators, um, they, and people literally go around the world pre-COVID, and they also need people in every state and every city in the United States that are working for USICS. So again, it's not specifically criminal law, but it would be things that would be related to um, you know, legal as well as civil, civil laws, as well as um, 
uh, investigative skills. Well, thank you all so much. I know I, know I learned a lot tonight um, and I'm so happy to have had you all, the panelists join us and share their experiences and their wisdom with us. And um, if, uh, if anyone would like to uh, connect with these folks, I'm sure they'd be happy to to see you on LinkedIn um, or over email. And um, I know I'm, I know you're gonna go visit uh, Professor Lichty over in the virtual career office. And I'm sure you may, if you don't have her, haven't had her already, you probably will have her soon in the classroom, Professor Finkelstein. So I just wanna thank you all again for joining us tonight um, and have a great evening. Thank you. Mm -hmm.